Good morning, everyone. Although honored by your kind invitation to be here this morning, I am more deeply honored by your presence. And I thank you for this opportunity to share with one another our love of history. As a northerner by birth who has lived in Mississippi for almost 40 years now, for those of you who have not had the sheer pleasure of a Mississippi summer, let me tell you. <laughs> temperatures often exceed 100 degrees. Humidity is always a pleasant 200%. I can count the number of times I've seen snow on uh, one finger. And so about the only time I see snow is when I come up here to Minnesota to speak to one of the various Civil War roundtables. And so I thank you for keeping that tradition alive <laughs> and for giving me such a cold, white welcome here. I deeply appreciate it. My colleague Jim was talking about uh, his uh, slow speed moving into this new technological age. Well. I have lost the race to a glacier. And so if Jim is low tech, I am still no tech. And quite frankly, I'm very proud of it. One of the drawbacks of having retired from the National Park Service is I can no longer get all the number of free brochures that I would like to have. I only had a paucity of brochures with me today, so if you would be kind enough to share those uh, with your neighbor, please. Out of curiosity, how many of you have been to Vicksburg before? Gosh, a good number. Well, allow me to say, for those of you who have been to Vicksburg, there have been numerous changes in Vicksburg since your last visit. For those of you who have never had the opportunity, you're in for a real treat when you finally do visit Vicksburg. Vicksburg National Military Park was set aside by the Congress back in 1899. It was the fifth Civil War battlefield to be set aside in perpetuity by the Congress, making it only the seventh national park. Vicksburg happens to be, along with Chickamauga, one of the more densely monumented battlefields in the world, today boasting of more than 1,380 monuments, markers, tablets, and plaques. And the statues of stone and bronze that you shall see as you drive along the park tour road were executed by the foremost American and European sculptors of the late 19th, early 20th centuries, and have collectively made Vicksburg, in the words of one Civil War veteran, the art park of the world. And that's a distinction of which we are immensely proud. And so we cordially invite you to visit with us and our good friends over at Chickamauga during this, the sesquicentennial year of those actions. Biographer and newspaperman Lloyd Lewis fittingly describes the Mississippi River in the mid-19th century as being the spinal column of America, the symbol of geographic unity. He refers to the great river as the trunk of the American tree, with limbs and branches reaching to the Alleghenies, the Canadian border, the Rocky Mountains. For more than 2,000 miles, the river winds silently on its course to the sea, and the Mississippi River and its tributaries were the interstate highways of their day, and there was none larger or more significant than the Mississippi River. In fact, the Mississippi River then, as it remains to this date, was the single most important economic feature of the continent, providing a natural artery for commerce. And over its muddy waters were steamboats and flatboats of all description, heavily laden with the rich agricultural produce of the land, <coughs> excuse me, and route to world markets. One contemporary wrote emphatically that the valley of the Mississippi is America. Upon the secession of the southern states, and in particular Mississippi and Louisiana, the river was closed to unfettered navigation, which threatened to strangle northern commercial interest. It was imperative for the administration in Washington to regain control of the lower Mississippi River Valley, thereby opening that avenue of commerce to enable the rich agricultural produce of the land to reach world markets. Shortly after the outbreak of hostilities between the states, President Abraham Lincoln assembled his civil and military leaders to discuss strategy for opening the Mississippi River and for ending what he termed a rebellion in the southern states. Seated around a large table, examining a map of the nation, Lincoln made a wide sweeping gesture with his hand, then placed his finger on the map at Vicksburg and said, See what a lot of land these fellows hold, of which Vicksburg is the key. The war can never be brought to a close until that key is in our pocket. It was the president's contention 
that we could take all the northern ports of the Confederacy, meaning on the inland waters, yet they can defy us from Vicksburg. It means hog and hominy without limit, fresh troops from all the states of the far south, and a cotton country in which they could raise the staple without interference. Lincoln went on to assure his listeners that I am acquainted with that region and know what I am talking about. And as important as New Orleans will be to us, Vicksburg will be more so. I trust you agree those are powerful statements coming from the 16th president. But they were no exaggeration for you. See, Confederate cannon mounted on the high ground at Vicksburg on bluffs that tower 300 feet above a horseshoe-shaped bend of the Mississippi River were not only trained on the river, but denied that important avenue of commerce to northern shipping. It was imperative for the administration in Washington to regain control of that vital waterway, and to do so, they would need to capture Vicksburg. By gaining control of the lower Mississippi River Valley, you would also divide the Southern Confederacy in two parts. For as all of you know from your study of geography, west of this great waterway were three states of the Southern Confederacy, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, as well as the Indian territories that were militarily and politically aligned with the Confederacy. Almost one half the land mass of the Confederate States of America was west of the Great River. And in that vast trans-Mississippi region, as it was called, came tremendous quantities of food, clothing, medicine, ammunition, as well as reinforcements of fresh troops on which the armies of Robert E. Lee and Braxton Bragg, operating much farther to the east, relied on. And so by gaining control of the lower Mississippi River Valley, not only would you divide the Southern Confederacy in two along the line of the river, you would sever those vital supply and communication lines, achieve a major objective of the Union Anaconda Plan, and effectively seal the doom of Richmond. With all that in mind, it's easy to understand and recognize that Vicksburg was a city of unparalleled significance during the course of the Civil War, and that significance would only grow as the war itself continued. Now, to wrestle control of this great waterway away from Confederate forces, the Lincoln administration assembled sizable land and naval forces, which moved in a two-prong operation to wrestle control of the river away from the Confederates. Moving downriver was a combined land and naval force that would gain victory at Forts Henry and Donelson in February 1862, Shiloh in April of that same year, and in June compel the surrender of the Queen City of Memphis. Coming upriver from the Gulf of Mexico was the Blue Water Navy, the ships of the West Gulf Blockading Squadron, under the command of then Flag Officer David Glasgow Farragut. Farragut squadrons would bombard and pass Confederate Forts Jackson and St. Philip, and in late April compel the surrender of the Crescent City itself. Now, New Orleans happened to be the largest city in the Confederacy, boasting a wartime population of 160,000 souls. As I'm sure many of you have been to New Orleans, nothing compared to the modern metropolis that we all know and love. But to give you some idea of the size and significance of New Orleans, does anyone know what the second largest city in the Confederacy was in its population? I'm sorry? I'm hearing a lot of names, but then none are sounding uh, quite right. Natchez, oh no, way down the list. Montgomery? Charleston, very good. Who said Charleston? Let's give her a hand. All right. Do you know its population? No, you're a little too low, but had you guessed correctly, I would have asked you, can you name them? <laughs> Charleston is correct. Population 45,000. Richmond, Virginia, capital of the Confederacy, 40,000. Atlanta, Georgia, between 10 and 12,000. Vicksburg, Mississippi, the second largest city in the state of Mississippi, 5,000 souls. So you can see that the loss of New Orleans that early in the war was quite a blow to Southern morale. Conversely, it was a boost to Northern morale, and with the initial success behind him, Farragut's squadron continued upriver. Baton Rouge would fall to the Federals on May the 8th, Natchez, Mississippi, four days later, and the flotilla would continue northward toward Vicksburg. Following the loss of New Orleans, Confederate forces began to fortify the city of Vicksburg. The troops that had been responsible for the defense of the uh, Crescent City had moved by rail from New Orleans to Jackson, then westward to Vicksburg, and began the construction of powerful river batteries that would be completed by the arrival of Farragut's squadron in mid-May of 1862. As the vanguard of Farragut's flotilla arrived below the fortress city, 
A skiff was lowered over to the side of one of the warships, and under a flag of truce, moved up to the city's waterfront, where demand was made for the city's surrender. Now, as this note was simply addressed to the authorities in Vicksburg, three replies were received. One from the mayor, one from the post commander, one from the garrison commander. All three, of course, were in the negative. But of those three replies, perhaps the most interesting came from Lieutenant Colonel James Autry that read in part that Mississippians don't know and refuse to learn the meaning of surrender. If Admiral Farragut thinks he can teach them, let him try. Well, incensed by this response, Farragut ordered his gun crews into action. And so in mid-May of 1862, we will have the first hostile shot fired against the fortress city of Vicksburg. And from mid-May all through June and into late July, the ships of the West Gulf Blockading Squadron would hammer away at the Confederate shore batteries. But the ocean-going vessels, their guns restricted by their gun ports, could not be elevated properly to draw an effective fire on the high ground at Vicksburg. Conversely, the forts on the high ground behind thick parapet walls, the guns could not be depressed sufficiently to draw an effective fire on the gunboats. And so although both sides hammered away at one another throughout the hot summer of 1862, there was very little damage suffered or inflicted by either side. But by late July, Farragut, plagued by rapidly falling waters in the Mississippi River, widespread sickness among his crews, realized that he could not compel the surrender of the fortress city of Vicksburg based solely on the might of his naval guns, and so withdrew to safer, deeper waters below Baton Rouge. And so Vicksburg had withstood its first test under fire. But it was realized then and there by both Union and Confederate high commands that if Vicksburg were going to fall, it would be at the hands of a massive combined land and naval operation. Now, already the river batteries were in place. They were strong. They were powerful. Indeed, they were formidable. But all the land approaches to the city of Vicksburg were open and thus vulnerable. The decision was made by the Confederate High Command to construct a line of defense, what would become known as the rear line of defense, that would ring the entire city, forming, if you will, a backward letter C. The flanks of this line would be rested on the Mississippi River both above and below the city. It stretched for more than eight miles and consisted of nine major forts connected by a continuous line of trenches and rifle pits. Ultimately, it would be manned by a garrison of 30,000 troops, mount 172 big guns, and posed a major obstacle to Union domination of the Mississippi River. This line of fortifications would be completed by the onset of winter, but it would not be manned during those winter months as the actor theater of operations had shifted into North Mississippi. Not being manned throughout the winter months, it would not be properly maintained. And by the spring of 1863, in the campaign that we're going to talk about here this morning begins in earnest, those fortifications will be in a state of disrepair. Now, as mentioned, Jim is low tech. I'm still no tech. And so I don't have anything to show up on the uh, screen for you. But if you take a look at your park folder, and by the way, the cover is an illustration by famous Civil War artist Mort Kunzler showing General Grant riding victoriously into the city on July the 4th. One of those unit's flags that you see on here is that of the 4th Minnesota Infantry, uh, part of Colonel John Sanborn's brigade. If you open your park folder, you'll see a campaign map. It's a smaller one here that will show you the movements of the Union forces throughout the Vicksburg campaign leading up to the siege of the city. We're going to talk about Minnesota's role in this campaign leading up to the siege. So if you follow along on that particular map, and somebody doesn't have one up front, I can give that to you. How's that? By late fall of 1862, after the failure of this grand Confederate offensive, which in the East ended disastrously for the Army in Northern Virginia on the banks of Antietam Creek, in Kentucky with Braxton Bragg's defeat at Perryville, and in Mississippi with the defeat of Confederate forces under General Sterling Price at Iuka and Earl Van Dorn at Corinth, the initiative would swing over to Union forces. And in the Western Theater of Operations, the army that we'll be talking about for the men in blue would be that of the Union Army of the Tennessee under the command of Major General Ulysses S. Grant. Grant's objective now would be the fortress city of Vicksburg. And throughout the winter of 1862-1863, Grant would orchestrate a series of operations aimed at Vicksburg. 
not only with his Central Mississippi campaign, launched in late November and continuing on into December, end in dismal failure as his lines of supply and communications were cut by General Earl Van Dorn, who sacked his advanced base of supplies at Holly Springs, Grant would also orchestrate a series of ill-fated bio campaigns, the object of which was to get on the same side of the river as the Confederates, where on high, dry ground he can put his army in motion and his artillery to use. But all of these bio campaigns from the Lake Providence campaign, the Steeles bio operation to the abortive canal across DeSoto Point opposite Vicksburg would end in failure for Grant, the only result being an ever lengthening casualty list. Consequently, by late spring of 1863, there is tremendous clamor in the northern press to remove Grant as commander of the Western Army. Even members of the cabinet are urging President Lincoln to remove Grant and replace him with someone else. But the president answered those critical of Grant by saying, I can't spare this man. He fights. I'll try him a little longer. While cognizant of the criticism swirling around his name in both political and military circles, and aware of the fact that even the president's patience had limitations, Grant realized that his time and his options were fast running out. He must do something quickly and successfully if he is to retain command of this army. And so by late spring, Grant examines his options. Having failed north of the city in the swamps of the Mississippi Delta, having failed across the river in Louisiana, Grant realizes that perhaps the only viable option left him is to move his army south through Louisiana, search for a favorable crossing point of the Mississippi River somewhere south of the fortress city of Vicksburg, transfer the area of operations to the area south and east of Vicksburg, the area in which the Confederates would least expect them. And with grim determination, Grant boldly opted for the march south through Louisiana. And on March 29th of 1863, he would issue his orders to begin this movement south through Louisiana. So if you take a look at your campaign map, you'll see that Grant's army would leave its base camps around Milliken's Bend and Young Point, Louisiana, on March the 31st of 1863. And for the next month, slog their way south through Louisiana, corduroying roads, building bridges practically each step of the way. It was backbreaking, laborious work, but inexorable at the same time. As the Union Army slogged its way south through Louisiana, and being good northerners, all of you, you are remarkable people, aren't we? But I have yet, in all my years of study, find any evidence to suggest that these Union soldiers, even those from Minnesota, could walk on water. Grant is going to need means of getting across this mighty river, isn't he? Fortunately, working in tandem with the Union Army of the Tennessee would be the gunboats of the Mississippi Squadron, commanded by Rear Admiral David Dixon Porter. Grant and Porter worked very well together. And when Grant first approached the Admiral with the idea of running his gunboat fleet past the batteries of Vicksburg, Porter was aghast at the mere suggestion. But he realized Grant was serious. And so he told Grant, think long and hard about this, General. If that's what you need me to do, I'll make the attempt. Just bear in mind that should my fleet get below the batteries of Vicksburg, it will not come back upstream until Vicksburg has fallen. You see, moving downstream with the powerful current of the Mississippi River, the gunboats can make about six knots. But coming upstream against that powerful current, they would be slow to only two knots. As a result, they would be under Confederate shore fire for a prolonged period of time, and it was believed that not even the powerful ironclads could withstand the shelling that would be hurled against them. And so Porter cautions Grant to think long and hard about this, and he does. A few days later, he comes back to Admiral Porter and says, Admiral, this is the only viable option left us. With Porter's buy-in, Grant begins the movement south through Louisiana, and so as his soldiers are quartering roaring roads and building bridges, Porter will prepare his fleet for a task deemed impossible by many, running by the batteries of Vicksburg. The dark, moonless night of April the 16th is selected for the attempted passage as the moon will set early that night. Earlier in the day, the fires are lit so that by nightfall, they are burning hot and clean, leaving no telltale plumes of smoke and sparks emanating from the stacks. Around 9 o'clock in the evening, the order is given. The anchors are raised. The vessels drift out into the current. And with the force of the current, move downstream around DeSoto Point toward the city of Vicksburg. Porter's vessels 
We'll be hugging the Louisiana shoreline, where it was hoped that the dense stand of trees will help conceal them from the eyes of Confederate lookouts. Sure enough, Admiral Porter in the lead vessel, the Benton, will round DeSoto Point and pass by battery number one in line, the powerful water battery. Not a sound nor movement is seen or heard. But suddenly, the night sky is ablaze as Confederates have spotted the fleet. They immediately set fires along the river banks where they have placed barrels of tar, bales of cotton soaked in turpentine, a fire, not only to illuminate the river, but they set fires on both banks to silhouette the Union fleet as it runs by the battery. Suddenly, the dull boom of heavy guns is heard as the Confederate cannon open fire upon the fleet. Porter pays very close attention as to where the shot and shell are hitting his vessels, and he realizes they're hitting his smokestacks, his pilot houses and wheel houses, the hurricane decks, the upper decks of the vessel. A few are getting down to the gun decks, but almost none are getting lower to, to where the vital parts of your boats are located, your engines, your steam drums, your mud filters, and so on. And he realizes one of two things is happening here. Either these Confederates are very poor gunners, or there's a fatal flaw in the placement of their batteries preventing their tubes from being depressed sufficiently to draw an effective fire against the gunboats in the river. Now, after more than 35 years of study of the Vicksburg campaign, I can certainly attest to the fact that when these batteries were planted, Confederate engineers tested them to see if they could hit the far side of the river, which they could easily do. It's well within their range. But I have yet to find any evidence to suggest that they ever tested the guns to see if they could hit the near bank. Believe me, of course, if they could hit the far bank, they could surely hit the near bank. But not so. Behind these thick parapets of earth and log, they could not depress their tubes sufficiently to draw an effective fire against the near bank of the river. And Porter recognized this fatal flaw in the placement of those batteries, and so quickly sent the signal flags up the, the, the poles as his vessels rounded DeSoto Point to move across the current, hug the Mississippi shoreline. And so close did these Union vessels get to the Mississippi shore batteries that men on board the vessels reported hearing the commands being given by Confederate gun captains. They could also hear bricks tumbling in the city streets, the effect of their own shell fire. But finally, the last vessel in line passed the southernmost battery, and when Porter tallied his losses, he realized he only lost one unmanned transport vessel. The impossible had been achieved, and with the fleet now below Vicksburg, Grant would have the wherewithal to cross the mighty river itself. Now, the Union Army of the Tennessee at this point in time consisted of three Army Corps. The 13th Corps commanded by Major General John McClernand, the 15th Corps commanded by Grant's most trusted subordinate officer, Major General William T. Sherman, and the 17th Corps commanded by Major General James McPherson, his youngest and most inexperienced Corps commander. Scattered among these corps will be three units from the great state of Minnesota. You will have the 4th Minnesota Infantry under the command of Lieutenant Colonel John Tortolot of uh, Mankato. You'll have the 5th Minnesota Infantry under Colonel Lucius Hubbard, the former tinsmith and editor turned soldier who would go on to become governor of this state in the 1880s, and the guns of the 1st Minnesota Light Battery commanded by Captain William Clayton. The Minnesota units will only be in the corps commanded by Sherman and McPherson. Consequently, they will not participate in the opening clash of the action on Mississippi soil. As Grant's army and Porter's gunboats rendezvous below the fortress city of Vicksburg, Grant's desired crossing point, as you'll see on your map, is Grand Gulf, where is a good all-weather landing and from which point roads radiated deep into the interior of the state. But guarding the landing site at Grand Gulf were two powerful bastions, Forts Coben and Fort Wade, situated on the bluffs 20 feet and 40 feet respectively above the Mississippi River. On April 29th, Porter's gunboats would go into action to silence these batteries and pave the way for a landing by Grant's infantrymen. Although they silenced the guns of Fort Wade, they could not silence those of Fort Coben. And Grant realized that it would be suicidal to send heavily laden troop transports to attempt a landing in the presence of enemy resistance. And so ever adaptive 
And let there be no doubt in your mind that that was Grant's true strength as a battle captain, his adaptability, his flexibility. Grant would simply disembark his invasion force, march them five miles farther down the natural levees, have Porter's gunboats run by the batteries of Grand Gulf that evening, and again rendezvous with him, this time at Disharoon Plantation. The very next day, on April 30th and into May 1st, Grant would hurl his army across the mighty river and onto Mississippi soil. It is the largest amphibious operation in American military history up to that time and will remain as such until Operation Torch in 1942. Grant will land more than 24,000 infantrymen, 60 pieces of artillery, and begin the inland campaign to capture Vicksburg. Now, the, over the next 17 days, in what was often referred to as the Blitzkrieg of the Vicksburg Campaign, Grant's army would march deep into the interior of the state, meeting and overcoming Confederate resistance in five actions. At Port Gibson on May the 1st, which is fought primarily between troops of the 13th Army Corps under General John McClernand and Confederate forces under the command of Brigadier General John Bowen. Bowen's troops, heavily outnumbered, will also be finally forced to compel uh, forced, uh, compelled to retire from the field. And so Union victory at Port Gibson on May 1st will not only secure Grant's beachhead on Mississippi soil, but compel the Confederate evacuation at Grand Gulf, which will now become Grant's staging area and his base of operations to support his inland drive. With victory at Port Gibson on May 1st, the direct road to Vicksburg is open. But Grant, who has a keen sense of topography and geography, realizes that that is not the best route to Vicksburg. Instead, he will move his army in a northeasterly direction, using the Big Black River on his left as a shield, if you will, in an attempt to move into the interior of the state and get astride the Southern Railroad of Mississippi, that rail line that you see on your map that connects Vicksburg with Jackson, the state capital, and from Jackson points elsewhere in the Confederacy. It is this rail line that is the line of supply and communications, the lifeline of Vicksburg, if you will, and its Confederate garrison, which was under the command of Lieutenant General John Pemberton. And so rather than march directly on Vicksburg, Grant is going to move into the interior of the state and sever his enemy's line of supply and communications. Now, to give you an illustration of the same methodology, bringing it to the modern age, many of you may recall that during the first Gulf War, then General and Chief Colin Powell was holding a news conference when one of the reporters asked him, General, what's your plan? As if he's going to go into any detail. <laughs> Powell's reply was simply, I'm going to cut him off and I'm going to kill him. And that's exactly what Grant is going to do here in Vicksburg. In May of 1863, he is going to cut his enemy, John Pemberton, off by severing his line of supply and communications. He's then going to turn west and kill Pemberton in Vicksburg. And so here we see Grant, in every sense of the word, a modern warrior. As Grant's army moves in a northeasterly direction, his three Army Corps will be aligned with John McClernand on the left closest to the enemy in Vicksburg at the point of contact. In the center, in that important swing position, will be his most trusted subordinate officer, William T. Sherman. And marching with William T. Sherman will be the troops of the 5th Minnesota Infantry under Colonel Lucius Hubbard. Way out on the Union right, farthest removed from the enemy, so it was believed, was Grant's youngest and most inexperienced Corps Commander, James McPherson. And with McPherson will be the troops of the 4th Minnesota Infantry and the guns of the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery. Now, I mentioned McPherson being young and inexperienced. He is a West Point grad, class of 1852, first in his class. So he's a highly skilled and a well-trained engineer. But at the outbreak of the Civil War, he is only a first lieutenant, still an engineering officer who has spent his entire career thus far either teaching at the point or constructing fortifications. But he will be assigned as an engineering officer to Grant's staff, and he will be with Grant at Henry and Donaldson and again at Shiloh. And Grant takes a liking to McPherson. After all, anybody who knew James McPherson liked him. He's young, handsome, jovial, considered by many to be the handsomest man in the Army. And Grant liked his company. And if U.S. Grant liked you, you were going to go places. He would see to it that young McPherson is transferred from an engineering position, a staff position, into a line capacity. And over a period of just 14 months, will rise from a first lieutenant to a major general, now has two stars on his shoulders, commanding a 12,500-man Army Corps. That's a pretty meteoric rise through the ranks. 
Uh, anybody here top that? <laughs> well, Grant, sensing McPherson's inexperience, sticks him way out on the Union right flank, farthest removed from Pemberton and the Confederates in Vicksburg. But as fate would cruelly dictate on March the 12th, it will be James McPherson and his soldiers, including the two Minnesota outfits I just mentioned, that would be the next to become engaged. You see, John Pemberton in Vicksburg divines Grant's intention of getting astride that railroad, and he hatches a plan for the destruction of the Union Army of the Tennessee. Pemberton will move his available field army east from Vicksburg to the line of the Big Black. He will order Confederate troops out of the capital city of Jackson to be lurking off to the Union right flank, hopefully find it, hit it fast, hit it hard, drive it in a westerly direction against the anvil of Pemberton's army at the Big Black River. Ott from Jackson will march the Confederate Brigade commanded by Brigadier General John Gregg. He has been cautioned by Pemberton that you might run into some Federals, but if so, it will simply be a flanking party, maybe a brigade strength unit at best. Find it, hit it fast, hit it hard, and roll up the Union line. And so John Gregg moves into position at the village of Raymond, and on the morning of May the 12th, he is notified that Union forces are indeed marching along the road toward Raymond from the village of Utica. The day is hot. It is dry. It has not rained in Mississippi at all thus far in the month of May. The roads are covered with thick inches of dust that raise tremendous clouds of suffocating dust, the ash just settling on the soldiers' uniforms and in their faces, clogging up their nostrils as well as their throats. As a result, to help alleviate the suffering caused by the dust clouds, the Union troops are going to have a wide separation in between the different regiments of each brigade, in between the different brigades, and even in between the different divisions marching down the road. Thus, the Confederate cavalry seeing this column coming down can only see the initial lead units, a brigade strength unit, and report back to John Gregg that Federal forces are moving along the Unica Road in brigade strength formation. This is exactly what John Gregg was anticipating, and so he will launch an attack. And in the early morning hours, it will be Gregg's Confederates that will attack the Union forces. Unbeknownst to Gregg, rather than a 3,000-man brigade, he is marching into battle against a 12,500-man Army Corps. The numbers will be against Gregg, and sure enough, although he enjoys initial success with additional Union units arriving on the battlefield, the Confederate attack will stall. And by mid-afternoon, General Crocker's division, which includes uh, the troops of the 4th Minnesota Infantry, this is Colonel Sanborn's brigade, Colonel uh, Tortolot's regiment, they will move on to the field of battle. McPherson will launch a counterattack. The Minnesotans will be out on his extreme left flank and consequently see no action that day. But the Union forces will succeed in driving the Confederates from the battlefield, forcing Gregg to fall back on the capital city of Jackson. Grant has just scored his second victory of the Vicksburg campaign. But the young, inexperienced McPherson, this being his first test as a combat officer in command of an Army Corps, was somewhat embarrassed by his actions that day. After all, he had been bested all morning long by an inferior force. And so when he reported to Grant, he simply said, I was attacked by lots of Rebs. <laughs> well, 3,000 men is a lot of men, isn't it? What McPherson failed to tell Grant, but I outnumbered them more than four to one. Well, Grant, based on this faulty or inaccurate report filed by McPherson, realized that there are probably more Confederates in the capital city of Jackson than he was comfortable with. And so rather than continue this movement toward the railroad, he is now going to swing his army in a northeasterly direction toward the capital city of Jackson. As a result, McClernand's Corps, the 13th Corps, will be put in a blocking position facing to the west, simply to keep Pemberton's, Pemberton's army farther to the west, while with two corps under McPherson and Sherman, he will advance on Jackson. And it will be a two-pronged advance against the capital city of Jackson. Coming in from the southwest will be Sherman's corps, and again, including the 5th Minnesota Infantry. Coming from the northwest from Clinton will be the 17th Corps under McPherson with the 4th Minnesota and the guns of the 1st Minnesota Light Artillery. As these columns begin converging on Jackson on May the 13th, Confederate reinforcements begin arriving from the east, most important of whom 
is General Joseph E. Johnston himself. Johnston will be directed by the authorities in Richmond to move to Mississippi to salvage the rapidly deteriorating situation. Johnston will arrive after a long, circuitous, and torturous train ride from Tullahoma, Tennessee into Jackson on the late afternoon, early evening of May the 13th, just a few hours before Grant's arrival. He arrives in the midst of a driving rainstorm. He is in ill humor. He is tired. He does not want to be in Mississippi. After listening to Gregg's report and without making any inspection of his own, Johnston will simply wire the authorities in Richmond I am too late, and orders the evacuation of the capital city. And so throughout the course of the night of May the 13th, the archives of the state of Mississippi are boxed up and sent off by train. The bulk of Johnston's garrison will withdraw from the city. He will leave a rear guard under John Gregg's command to fight a delaying action, simply to buy time to extricate his entire force. And with the rising sun on the 14th day of the month, here comes Sherman from the southwest, McPherson from the northwest, and they will encounter Gregg's Confederates on two separate fronts. But just as the Federals are advanced, uh, about to launch their assault, the skies open. And in Mississippi, there is no such thing as a gentle soaking rain. It always comes down by the bucketful. And it's not unusual to get a 10-inch rain in just a 24-hour period. Well, this rain is so intense that the Federals have to delay their assault for fear that by opening their cartridge boxes, their powder will get wet what powder is of no use whatsoever. So the attack is delayed for a couple hours, which enables Johnston to get out the last of his troops. And so at around 11 o'clock in the morning when the attack is made, there's just a paucity of Confederate troops that will be quickly overrun. And by day's end, Jackson will be in Union hands. Now in this action, Coming in on McPherson's front are the troops of the 4th Minnesota Infantry, part of Colonel John Sanborn's brigade. They are not in the lead. Although they will be deployed, they were not the lead brigade, and hence, as a result, in this action will only suffer the loss of two men wounded. Coming in from the southwest with Sherman will be the troops of the 5th Minnesota, but by the time the Minnesotans deploy into line of battle, the Confederates have evacuated Jackson, and they will march in uncontested to take possession of the capital city. So only two soldiers from Minnesota will be wounded in the Battle of Jackson. Not wishing to waste combat troops in occupation of Mississippi's capital city, Grant will order Jackson neutralized militarily. And by that, I mean he freely applies the torch to machine shops and factories, cuts telegraph lines and railroad tracks. Anything of military value is destroyed. With Jackson effectively neutralized, Grant now turns west toward his objective, the fortress city of Vicksburg. And en route between Jackson and Vicksburg, he will encounter the main Confederate army under the personal command of Lieutenant General John Pemberton at Champion Hill. And at Champion Hill on May the 16th, in what proves to be the largest, bloodiest, and most significant action of the Vicksburg campaign, Pemberton's army will be routed and driven from the field in panic and confusion. The only Minnesota troops to participate in the Battle of Champion Hill will be those of the 4th Minnesota. Their division is bringing up the rear of the Union column. Consequently, they will not get engaged until late in the day, by which time Pemberton's army is already withdrawing from the field of battle. Once again, in the action of Champion Hill, the soldiers from Minnesota will lose two men wounded. But it is a victory, a significant victory. Pemberton's army is sent reeling back toward the city. And the very next day along the line of the Big Black River, his rear guard will be overwhelmed, and the Confederate force will be driven back into the fortress city itself. On this day, May 17, 1863, as Pemberton watches the debacle of his troops along the line of the Big Black River and the wild flight of his men, he turns to one of his aides and said, just 30 years ago, I began my military career by accepting a cadetship to the U.S. Military Academy, and today, that same date, that career is ended in disaster and disgrace. And for all intents and purpose, it was. But it was a disaster that would affect an entire nation. On the hot afternoon of May the 17th, the citizens of Vicksburg watched in horror as the Confederates filed back into the city's fortifications. Mrs. Emma Balfour recorded the scenes by which she was engaged, uh, engulfed, as she wrote, from 12 o'clock until late in the night, the streets and roads were jammed with all that appertains to an army. Men, 
horses, wagons, cattle, stock, sheep, all being brought hurriedly within the entrenchment at Vicksburg. She noted there was no semblance of order or discipline as the troops moved about singly and in small groups. She observed that hundreds of men had no weapons. Entire batteries had been abandoned in the field at Champion Hill and the line of the Big Black River. Well, was this demoralized mass of humanity filling the city streets that assumed their position in the defense line and prepared to resist the Union onslaught that they knew would surely follow and Grant would not keep them long in waiting? The very next day on May the 18th, the Confederates catch sight of the Union columns approaching the city. One soldier, as he peered over the parapets of earth and log, gazed into the distance, said, we caught sight of the enemy as they approached the city. Their columns extended as far as the eyes could see. Their battle flags blew in the breeze above them, and their bayonets just glistened in the sunlight. And onward they came, a mighty host indeed. Well, this mighty host has gained five victories over the last 17 days. Grant is anxious for the knockout punch. On May the 19th, he will send his legions against the fortifications of Vicksburg. But it is an ill-conceived, poorly coordinated attack. Of, the, of his three Army Corps, only Sherman's Corps was in proper position to make the assault. And although Sherman's troops advancing from the northeast along the graveyard road, what you see on the other side of your brochures, as tour stops number five to tour stop number 10, Sherman's forces would manage to reach the Confederate fortifications, plant the colors along the exterior slope, but only to be checked and hurled back with a loss of about 1,000 soldiers. Grant realized that perhaps he had been a bit too hasty. He decided to make a more thorough reconnaissance, bring his entire army well up in hand, and try once more three days later on May the 22nd. Early in the morning of the 22nd day of May, more than 220 Union cannon opened fire, and for four solid hours, they will pummel the Confederate works with solid shot and shell, the thick smoke of the guns completely shrouding the fields. But at 10 o'clock, the guns fall silent, which was the signal for the infantry to advance. On the north end of the line, along the graveyard road, come the troops of Sherman's 15th Army Corps. In the center, along the Jackson Road, which you see in your map at tour stop numbers two and number three, will come the troops of the 17th Army Corps, commanded by Major General James McPherson. And coming up from the southeast, where you see tour stop number uh, uh, 13 in the park, will be the troops of the 13th Army Corps, under General John McClernand. Although the Union troops managed to reach the Confederate fortifications on all three fronts and plant their colors atop the parapets on the exterior slope, only on John McClernand's front at Railroad Redoubt will he make a penetration of the Confederate fortifications. McClernand seeing his troops inside Railroad Redoubt, seeing them pour in to the ditches fronting the Confederate fortification at 2nd Texas Lunette at tour stop number 11 on, I'm sorry, tour stop number 12 on your map, he will send a note off to Grant, saying that I am in part possession of two Confederate forts over which the stars and stripes are gloriously flying. And he asks that the assaults be renewed all along the front, simply to keep pressure off him, helping him to exploit his success. Grant doubted the veracity of this note. But although he could not confirm or refute McClernand's claim, he had no recourse but to comply with the request. And so early in the afternoon, the assaults are renewed all along the front. Up on the north, on Sherman's front, will come the Eagle Brigade, known as such because of Old Abe, the mascot of the 8th Wisconsin Infantry. In the Eagle Brigade are the 5th Minnesota, are the troops of the 5th Minnesota under Colonel Lucius Hubbard. Fortunately for these Minnesotans, the Eagle Brigade will attack in a column formation, four regiments in a line. The Minnesotans happen to be at the very back end of the line, so they, have been, they will be spared heavy casualties this day. Although the Eagle Brigade, led by Old Abe, will manage to reach the parapets of Vicksburg, they will be stopped short and at the point of bayonet hurled back. And so Colonel Lucius Hubbard and his Minnesotans will only lose that same number once again, two wounded. On McPherson's front, will be the troops of the 4th uh, Minnesota. This is Colonel John Sanborn's brigade, Colonel Tar uh, Tortelot's infantry regiment. As they had advanced that morning, they came within 300 yards of the Confederate works, 
when they would be stopped by a thick obstruction of felled trees. And all along the Confederate front, the Confederates had formed an abatis, as it was called. Trees toppled toward likely avenues of enemy approach. All those branches were intertwined. They were then stripped and sharpened in an entanglement of telegraph wire strung in front of those fallen limbs. And the whole purpose of this obstruction was to disrupt approaching lines of infantry. Wherefore, if the Union Army, in its advance against the city's fortifications, advanced in the conventional format of the time period with man touching man two ranks deep. All along their front they would encounter this obstruction of felled trees. If they tried to maintain their alignment, obviously many of these soldiers are going to trip over that entanglement of wire and impale themselves on these fallen limbs. At best they'll be able to filter through singly and in small groups. And singly and in small groups, once on the other side of the obstruction, they would be easy targets for the Confederate riflemen. Sanborn's men cannot penetrate the Abati. As a result, they will be sent to reinforce John McClernand and help exploit the success gained by the 13th Army Corps at Railroad Redoubt. But by the time the Minnesotans and Sanborn's brigade gets on McClernand's front, McClernand's troops are falling back. The day is lost. The Minnesotans will make a desperate charge in which they'll lose 12 men killed, 42 wounded, but the attacks all along the front are driven back. Grant will resort to siege operations. And so for the remainder of the month of May, Grant will slowly extend his lines to the left and to the right until they completely encircle the beleaguered garrison inside of Vicksburg, cutting the citizens and soldiers alike off from all supplying communications with the outside world. They will have to rely solely upon what they had stockpiled in Vicksburg since the beginning of the siege. And with each passing day, those supplies would dwindle. John Pemberton would cut the standard issue from a full rations to three quarters, down to half, down to quarter. They would be cut again and yet again and yet again. By the end of June, this garrison is subsisting on a handful of peas and rice issued once a day per man. Even their water was rationed to one cup per man per day. And in the heat of a Mississippi summer, the suffering was intense. As Grant's siege lines around the city become more solid, Confederate forces on the west side of the river will launch an attack against his supply enclaves at Milliken's Bend and Young's Point. On June the 7th, in the action at Milliken's Bend, U.S. color troops will successfully defend Grant's supply enclave and hurl the Confederate, uh, Confederates back. Grant, wishing to clear these Confederates completely from that portion of Louisiana, will send the Eagle Brigade over to Louisiana. And on June the 15th, the 5th Minnesota Infantry and the troops of the Eagle Brigade will engage with Confederate forces in the village of Richmond, which you see on your map, driving them back. The Minnesotans in this action will lose seven men wounded. As Grant's forces, by laying siege to the city, he is well aware of the fact that Confederate forces under Joseph Johnston's command have reoccupied the capital city of Jackson, where he has been raising a force that would become known as the Army of Relief, the purpose of which was to march on Vicksburg, break through Grant's encircling army, and rescue the garrison in Vicksburg. As a result, to contend with the threat posed by Joseph E. Johnston, Grant would call for reinforcements of his own, and they would be duly sent by the tens of thousands. Among the reinforcements that would be sent to Grant are the troops of the 3rd Minnesota Infantry. These are the troops under the command of Colonel Chauncey Gra uh, Griggs. His men will arrive at Haynes Bluff, Snyder's Bluff, which you see on your map north of Vicksburg. They will be part of what became known as the exterior line a line constructed north and east of Vicksburg facing north and east to guard against any threat posed by General Joseph Johnston. But these Minnesotans would see no action whatsoever as Johnston's force in the long run would not move from the capital city of Jackson until July the 1st, by which time it was too little and too late. On July the 3rd, on the 46th day of siege, Pemberton despairing that Johnston is coming to his assistance opens up negotiations with Grant for the surrender of the city. Pemberton, a northerner by birth, tells his subordinates, I know my people, meaning the northerners. They are a vainglorious and egotistical lot. Of course, he's not talking about anybody from Minnesota. <laughs> he said they would give anything if the city is to be surrendered on the great national holiday of July 4th. And with that in mind, opens negotiations with Grant, who offers no terms other than an immediate and unconditional surrender of the city. 
Pemberton very angrily shakes his finger in Grant's face and said, I can assure you, General, you'll bury many more of your troops then before you ever enter into the city of Vicksburg. Well, cooler heads would prevail. The two generals would agree on a cessation of hostilities, and the surrender itself would be consummated the next day on July 4th. Grant would order his division commanders to send troops into the city who have merited special recognition. James McPherson will order in one brigade of John Logan's division and one brigade of uh, Marcellus Crocker's division, and that would be the brigade of John Sanborn, including the 4th Minnesota Infantry. Although the 45th Illinois was slated to be the first Union regiment in Vicksburg, and the Minnesotans were ordered to wait for them. When they got to the meeting point, they waited and waited and waited. The soldiers from Illinois never showed up. And so Colonel Sanborn, getting tired of the wait, no doubt also hoping to claim the, the distinction of being the first troops into Vicksburg, will order shoulder, uh, shoulder, uh, soldiers to shoulder their weapons and march into the city. And so it would indeed be the troops of the 4th Minnesota Infantry that would be the first into the city of Vicksburg. They would pull down the stars and bars of the Confederacy, replace it with the stars and stripes symbolic of Union victory, and when informed of the fall of Vicksburg a few days later, President Abraham Lincoln would simply sigh, thank God, the father of waters again flows unvexed to the sea. And so in this campaign, which is regarded by a growing number of historians as the most decisive campaign of the American Civil War, as I hope I've pointed out today, Minnesotans would play a stellar role and claim their share of the victory. And with that, I thank you very much.